So I'm going to talk about um, this next wave of augmented intelligence. Has anyone heard of augmented intelligence? So a few there. Has anyone heard of artificial intelligence? Okay, so a few more hands there. So really, augmented intelligence is a new term, and it's not well known, it's not well accepted, and that's part of the um, problem I'm going to talk about is there's kind of a Tower of Babel problem when it comes to this, this new application area. There's about 20 different terms used at conferences that address this right now. And so that's part of the issues. There's not really a, an awareness of this approach. And I'm going to talk about the different kind of uh, versions of it um, and also just some of the, the backdrop that led to this. So part of the reason for going down this path is um, I built this AI company, Mtel, over a decade. And a lot of the work I did was working closely, building the technology, and then going out and working on the deployment side with teams of users doing workshops, getting them to adopt these systems. And in our, our case, we had a machine learning platform for machines. So it was machine learning applied to um, all the sensor data coming off machinery to learn signatures or patterns of different types of equipment failure, like a bearing failure signature, you know, an impeller failure signature, um, understand what that kind of looks like, be able to predict it, prevent equipment failure, and we called prescriptive analytics was not just giving a prediction, but also a prescription. Actually, much more difficult because you can tell them, you know, it's like if you go to the cancer, if you go to the doctor, let's say, and they tell you, um, bad news, you've got a year to live. And you say, oh, okay, is, can I do anything about that? And what if they said, you know, no, you're just, that's it. That's, at least you'd have time to plan. But what if you go in and they say you have a year to live? But we can do you know, a tumor removal, we can do this and that, um, some chemo, maybe dietary changes, things like that. So that's a prescription, and that's much more useful than just a prediction with no actual actionable information. What's the intervention you can do? And the sort of funny paradox is if you do the prescription right, you falsify the prediction. So your prediction is you're going to fail in 30 days, and your prescription is to change the bearing, and then it doesn't fail in 30 days, and then they would go, oh, well, you must have been wrong. And so it's this funny kind of paradox. But if you do your job right in this realm, you falsify the, the failure prediction. And that's, that's what we want to do. Of course, you, track, you prove it by tracking metrics over time, mean time between failure and things like that. But the key thing I observed was that um, hu the human intuition played a huge role, especially on the prescription side. Because you, you generate a prediction. And there's all kinds of contextual knowledge about the facility, the environment, if a new operator got plugged in, things that we don't currently have structured data for that weren't fed into our AI system. And so it was really the intersection of the two that we saw just amazing results. And um, you hear a lot about you know, job loss and automation. But what we saw is a lot of these um, process and mechanical engineers got really excited about this and had their own kind of hero moments. We always gave them the credit. You know, an agent triggered an alert, but it was Greg that went out and did the inspection and applied his knowledge. And, and ultimately, a lot of them got promoted. And, you know, of course, they, they, they had pretty, for them, the KPIs are often zero fatalities. So it's, it's a pretty extreme environment. But, um, and then we were acquired in 2016. But um, so this kind of backstory of, of humans working with AI, I saw it firsthand. And so I started kind of exploring that. And so I formed this kind of informal um, collective or mastermind group of other people in AI. And we all kind of crowdsourced. We said, look, are, is everyone seeing the same issue where you know, we're not seeing recognition of the human role? And we said, AI's had these breakthroughs. But an AGI is, of course, artificial general intelligence. It's one sort of path to super intelligence. We've had these breakthroughs in machine vision and car autonomy, but have we had a discovery of a new elemental law of physics. Have we had something Nobel Prize worthy? Uh, um, something like you know, flight, energy, space? And the answer was no. You know, AI hasn't done anything at that level. So it's, been, it's been humans. So we kind of started this exploration of what is it you know, that AI is not doing right? What are we doing right? And how could we kind of work together more? So in this exploration, um, I've had a chance to really research and explore what is, you know, what's special about humans, what's special about AI. Um, I did write a book on this called Augmented Mind. Um, shameless plug there. So uh, 
I guess I owe you $25 now. Um, but it, um, it's, it kind of gave me a chance to actually go out and interview a lot of people on this. And I think there was a recognition that everything is, is really very complementary in, in surprising ways. I mean, what AI does exceptionally well right now is, is very different than what humans do well at a detailed level. And, you know, we, we have intuition and creativity, which we can get into definitions of that. We have embodied cognition. We grow up with extensive interactions with the real world, both physically, mentally, running experiments. Um, John Piaget said that children are natural scientists, and so I've seen this in my own two-year-old. She runs thousands of experiments every day, and we grow up, and we've run millions of experiments interacting with the world by the time we're adults. And so we have that embodied cognition. We can detect dynamic patterns, um, and of course, have these epiphanies. Uh, you know, AI can look at immense data sets, um, perform kind of brute force search, of course, as we all know, um, and do really good well at static pattern recognition, but it doesn't do quite as well in these involving environments, and, and that's another area where we can kind of work together. A couple quotes. I, what I thought was interesting is a lot of these, like, uh, sort of pinnacle scientists all have these recognition of the power of their own intuition. And, and it, it's sort of this mysterious thing, and a lot of them kind of recognized and, and sort of honored that, like as if it was a sacred gift, or um, the mathematician Ramanujan said that a Hindu goddess would whisper um, these number theorems into his, into his ear at night. But basically, it seems like these things, these epiphanies just come from beyond. And so that's one of our um, kind of not well understood gifts. So we do kind of have an AI race, um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen and heard about the investment competition. Um, and you know, to put that in context, the Manhattan Project nuclear race, uh, we spent in the US about $32 billion in today's dollars. It was over sort of three or four years. Uh, Apollo program, $169 billion, but over 10 years in today's dollars. Um, incidentally, the Human Genome Project, only about $5 billion, so not too bad. Um, AI race, I mean, on the VC side, private investment, they estimate about $15 billion last year. Um, depending how they tabulated, either it was a little more in China, some other reports say it was more in the U.S., but kind of neck and neck, which I think is, is ultimately good. A little competition probably helps to, to spur things along. So augmented intelligence, back to kind of the definition. Whenever one of a lot of these terms about human AI collaboration most of the examples you'll, you'll see people really tout are what I would really call collective intelligence, sort of wisdom of crowd type applications. So what that says is you're all basically ants operating in a hive, and the hive has intelligence, but you all don't. You know, and we're going to extract information from your minds and your data and have some kind of like you know, hive or Borg that will have the super intelligence, but you'll just kind of be there you know, plugging away like a cog in the wheel. So not very inspiring. Um, but that's kind of one of the key um, focal points for this, this type of hybrid intelligence. And that's really different than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, more like a pairwise concept, which has been called a centaur, where individuals would be augmented by some kind of AI platform. And people like, you know, Richard Feynman, Albert Einstein, um, you wouldn't necessarily say we're going to be like, snooping on all their data and trying to derive insights, but what could empower them to make more, you know, energy and space type discoveries, breakthrough discoveries, and that's kind of, that's more of the focus of this, uh, this type of application. And, you know, when we talk about super intelligence, um, we have human level intelligence today, we have artificial intelligence. It seems logical the whole could be more than the sum of the parts to get to super intelligence. I think my perspective is, I'd like all of us to have super intelligence and not some kind of higher level, you know, thing that's operating in a hive kind of perspective. So where do, you know, as I explored this concept, the, the people that had these epiphanies that led to these step change breakthroughs in, in science and energy and things like that, um, these epiphanies don't come to amateurs. And so there's been studies on what, what, leads to human expertise. Of course, there's Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hour kind of rule of thumb, um, whether it's chess grandmasters or rock stars or mathematicians, tends to hold, even uh, Mozart didn't really compose 
any of his master symphonies until, until 10 years or 10,000 hours of practice. Um, Ray Kurzweil estimates that uh, human experts have, um, actually that's a typo, 100,000 chunks of information that we can kind of hold in one specific domain, so it takes a while to, to compile that. And, and then, of course, now you're primed for these kind of eureka moments, and, and those, are, those are these key things that AI currently can't do, and we do amazingly well, so how could we free us up to do more of that? And that's kind of the, that's kind of the path we've been exploring. So hybrid applications, some that you will see in addition to the collective intelligence, um, starting with the lower level things, um, guardian angels. Anyone heard of guardian angel applications? Not too much. So it's not, it's not very widely used, but it's used especially in autonomous uh, driving applications and in the industrial IoT. And what it means is you'll be going around your task. Let's say you're driving and you break out your iPhone and then you look up, you're about to rear end someone. That happened to me about two and a half years ago, and, and I did rerun someone. So um, it would have been nice to have a guardian angel. It wasn't out yet. Um, actually, I, have a, I do have a Tesla. I know several of the Tesla drivers here. It still doesn't have guardian angel, which is kind of surprising. But guardian angel means it will take control from you when it detects like an imminent collision or catastrophic thing that's going to happen. So it's like one person's in control, one is kind of monitoring, and will we'll take control and, and save, you know, save from that outcome. Virtual personal assistants, um, I'm sure you've all used it. Amazon, Alexa, Alexa Siri, stuff like that. Um, Google, Google Now, I guess. Uh, pretty underwhelming. I know we had a conversation about that the other week. So I mean, make a lot of mistakes. They found, you know, we all sort of tailor, reduce our expectations to what they can do. We actually tailor our vocabulary and our rate of speech and try to work with it almost like a very, um, you know, very needy type thing. But um, Certainly nothing like something that you'd partner with on a Manhattan Project, right? No, nowhere near that level. Um, virtual executive assistant would be getting a little higher up. Something, someone that you could entrust with, you know, not just saying low-level things like schedule dinner, but hey, I got people coming in town, figure out something good to do, like without giving all the detailed micro instructions. So that's moving a little higher up the hierarchy. Um, virtual coworker. The problem with that metaphor is there's often sort of an implicit competition between coworkers, and ideally, with an AI center partner, they're not currently earning salaries because they're not really sentient for the time being. So, I, I think that's problematic. It's really more of something that's going to help you have your hero moments, and coworkers typically don't do that. Um, so, we're talking more like a virtual partner, scientific collaborator, and, and I think the goal here is. For people that have these amazing gifts of intuition, which we all really do, but in particular domains, what would empower them to get breakthrough kind of discoveries to move, move their field forward? Chess Centaur is one example. Um, I don't know if people have heard about this, but Kasparov, of course, lost to Deep Blue in 97. First, that was our chess singularity, right? So humans were surpassed, although with mostly a, blue, a brute force search kind of approach. Um, Kasparov then in one form freestyle chess competitions where you can have pure human, pure AI, or hybrid human AI teams, as you can probably all guess, or I wouldn't have this slide up. Um, the hybrid teams currently have the, the, the sort of state-of-the-art performance and are winning the tournaments. Um, I have an ongoing debate about that with the mastermind group because uh, we'll see if Alpha Zero and DeepMind changes that. Uh, games typically are environments where AI can perform better than humans because the rules are very kind of circumscribed. So eventually the chess example might go away, but when you get into the messy human realm that we all live in, it's an area where, the, again, the human kind of expertise becomes much more powerful. And incidentally, the term center, I didn't coin that. Um, the creator of Wired Magazine, Kevin Kelly, has a great book about um, called The Inevitable about future past, and he coined the term centaur. And I think it's a great term in the AI community, it's, it's not really an accepted term. In fact, um, there, there is a big wave of kind of skepticism about the Centaur approach, and I think there's a lot of historical reasons for that. But what I've seen is, is there's, there's just a tiny fraction of a fraction of investment in R&D in the Centaur augmented approach right now. And so you look at the path we're going about you know, automation or, or sort of are humans going to have a role and I've, I've seen it kind of break into two different categories. There's a, there's a group, what I'd call the replicators, that say that 
the best approach is to replicate human intelligence and just sort of allow AI to do whatever it does. There's another camp I'd call the augmenters that says, how about we you know, focus on augmenting humans and then maybe we'll A, be able to monitor for rogue or weaponized AI better and then B, you know, have, have a role in this, in this future world that, that we're creating. Another case study, manufacturing. So I touched on that at the beginning. Um, predictive and prescriptive. When you get to the diagnosis part, there's just so many contextual environmental uh, factors that come into play that even if you tried to get everything encoded in data, there's too much actual uncertainty and variability and changeability. So I mentioned dynamic environments. So somehow humans do extremely well in these dynamic environments about realizing, oh, well, we, we changed the recipe last year, so now that's no longer gonna apply and we're gonna do this slightly differently. And it's such an interconnected, nonlinear environment, and somehow we just tend to do well. And so we augment the AI systems. AI systems did extremely well at the pattern recognition, so they will you know, detect all those, those types of low-level symptoms and patterns, um, and the two work extremely well together. So mathematics, automated theorem proving. Uh, how many minutes do we have left? Two, okay. Um, you know, in the 50s, uh, people thought that within 10 years we'd have artificial superintelligence, of course, as we, we've all known. And, you know, they had some amazing breakthroughs. The logic theorist, first automated theorem prover, um, it proved a number of theorems from the Principia Mathematica that Whitehead had written. And so it seemed like we were on this path where we we're just going to have an automatic math and it'll be good to go. Um, shockingly, we found they did very poorly. It didn't scale. And um, more recently, we have a, a Mizar Mathematical Library. A lot of math papers, when you read them, it's a good thing to do it late at night, uh, get tired. But basically, they're actually not written in rigorous um, kind of encoding format. So people, because humans are, are good at, you know, you know that you're taking shortcuts. You don't have to go down to the lowest level in, in symbolism and so on. The Mizar library said everything has to be encoded completely consistently so a computer can understand it for lemmas and theorems and things like that. So they've proved 52,000 theorems, but only one has been like a significant one. So um, still humans massively outperforming for math proofs, which is an inherently very mathematical thing. And it, it gets into a lot of things about the way we do really guided search. And the, gui the guiding is, is gets into epiphanies and eureka moments. And, a little plug, I have a whole section of the book on that. But um, needless to say, we do that extremely well. And it, it, we do it sometimes when we're dreaming, sometimes when we're daydreaming. Um, most of the mathematicians, their eureka moments came when they were waking up or stepping onto a bus or things like that. So, um, so things like automated proof verification, compression, computer-assisted proofs. Um, right now, one of the interesting things is for these sort of apex mathematicians that are winning you know, the, these clay mathematics uh, millennium prizes and so on, how could they be augmented? So we're starting to see that, but there's still a huge need. Right now, it's, it's pure humans, so we're not even close to you know, kind of AI catching up on that. So um, as a final closing thing, uh, I guess we got 60 sec 30 seconds, zero. Um, I'll end there. Thank you very much. <laughs>